Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for a special celebration in honor of the naming of the Barada Center for Global Business and the endowment of the Global Business Fellows Program. We are extremely grateful for the generosity of our long-term friend and supporter, Joe Barada, and his wife, Abby. Thank you so much. <laughs> At the McDonough School of Business, we see business as an answer, perhaps the best answer to the world's most challenging problems, both economic and social. Of course, global business doesn't exist in ether. It lives at the intersection of policy and international relations, technology and law, and so many other fields. And so, with Joe's encouragement and leadership at Georgetown McDonough, we aim to educate our students in business, of course, along with many other academic and practical areas of expertise by collaborating with other schools at Georgetown so that our students can truly do well for themselves and well for the world. After all, our history at Georgetown is rooted in global discovery, dating back to the earliest days of the founding of the Jesuits. We are one of the few schools in the world that can truly say it is in our DNA to find new ways to build global knowledge, apply it effectively, and thereby serve the common good. And I can think of no better person that exemplifies this vision for the future of global business, education, than Joe Barada. And today, we're going to learn more about how his transformational gift will help support the advancement of global business for many years at com to come. Joe and Abby, thank you for your gift, yes, but thank you for your ongoing commitment to our students, to our programs, and to what global business is and really should be. It's now my pleasure to introduce President Jack DeJoya, who will share a few words about today's event and our new Barada Center for Global Business. Jack. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. Honored to be with you all this afternoon and to have this opportunity to celebrate this very special moment in the life of our university community. I want to, as, as Dean Almeida has shared, this is an exciting occasion for our McDonough School of Business and for Georgetown. And it's wonderful to be with all of you as we celebrate this important milestone in global business education here at Georgetown. And I want to thank you all for being here. Over the past decade, we've taken steps to ensure that Georgetown is a is a preeminent place for global business education. And as we have pursued this vision, we have been fortunate to have the engagement of Abby and Joe Barada, whose generosity has enabled us to establish important programs and launch new work. And we could not be more grateful for their deep commitment to Georgetown and for the teaching, research, and global experiences that they have helped to make possible for the members of our community. This afternoon, we celebrate their most recent gift, which will establish the Barada Center for Global Business, a permanent home for global business education at Georgetown, and will endow two significant projects, our Global Business Fellows Program for students interested in immersive global experiences, and a fund for faculty to create innovative courses and global experiences responsive to emerging trends in global business. These efforts will be integral in our ongoing effort to build interdisciplinary and cross-school collaboration around the study of business in a global context. So Joe and Abby, we want to thank you for your service as alumni leaders, 
for your generous contributions to our community, and we're grateful to you both for your presence, and Joe, for being a part of our conversation on private equity this afternoon. Joe brings deep experience and expertise in private equity. For over a decade, he has served as global head of private equity and senior managing director for Blackstone. He first joined Blackstone in 1998, and in 2001 was responsible for helping to establish their private equity business in Europe. Over his time at Blackstone, he has guided some of their most successful investments, such as SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment and Merlin Entertainments, which owns the Legoland theme parks, the London Eye, and, and Madame Tussauds. I have some personal family stories about visits to Legoland, but I'll save those for now. <laughs> well, just one. If you go to Legoland, <laughs> if you go to Legoland in, in, in Southern California near San Diego, and you go to a little piece of the park, it's called uh, you know, like Mini World or something like that. It's, it's replicas of the major iconic spaces in Rome and London and all around the, well, you go to Washington, D.C., and you see the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial, and my son, who was about six at the time, said, Dad, Dad, come here quick. There was Healy Hall right there in Legoland. And I, Joe, I think that predates you, so. <laughs> but Legoland is a favorite at our house, so. But Joe has been deeply engaged in our community, sharing his, his knowledge and his expertise as a member of our Board of Directors, as a member of our Board of Regents, Board of Advisors for the McDonough School of Business and our Global Business Initiative Advisory Board. So our purpose today is to express the depth of our appreciation to you both for being, being so closely connected to the vision of this, of this institution, of its mission, of its purpose. And Joe, we thank you for being a part of this conversation this afternoon and for sharing your insights on the future of private equity with our community. Joe will be joined in conversation by our colleague, Professor Rena Agarwal, the Robert E. McDonough Professor of Finance and the founding director of our Pissarros Center for Financial Markets and Policy at our School of Business. Before we turn to our conversation, we have the privilege of hearing from Professor Ricardo Ernst, the Barada Chair in Global Business and the Executive Director of the Latin American Leadership Program. Professor Ernst has been instrumental in guiding the development of our global bus business initiative over these past few years. So Ricardo, we want to thank you for your dedication to Georgetown and for your many contributions to this important work. Professor Ernst will introduce Anna Mendoza, a 2017 graduate who was part of the Global Business Fellows Program. So to share more about the vision for the Barada Center and to express our appreciation to Joe for his leadership at Georgetown, we've prepared a short film. So Joe and Abby, let me once again thank you for your service, for your generosity, for the vision you have helped us to realize for global business education at Georgetown. And we'll now show this video. Georgetown really shaped my life in the way it changed my life and gave me the belief in myself that I could achieve whatever I really set out to do. My work at Blackstone is to invest capital on behalf of many millions of retirees and manage and secure their retirements. We take what we do and the obligation we've been given you know, very, very seriously. My Georgetown experience informed my professional success because Georgetown's undergraduate business program is really there to teach future leaders, which includes an ethical underpinning, which is so important in business. I made this gift because I care deeply about Georgetown and its mission, and I think its opportunity to create the best possible undergraduate business program for globally-minded future business leaders. My partnership with Georgetown really started in 2007, talking about how we have more cooperation between the schools. I remember him telling us that his experiences within finance in the McDonough School were great, but he also remembers his classes in the rest of the university. And he really has encouraged us to bring that to our students as well. 
Georgetown's competitive advantage is the fact that it has world-class programs outside of just the business school, in the School of Foreign Service, in languages and linguistics, in the college. The Barada Global Business Center and the Associated Curriculum Innovation Grants is really meant to keep pushing forward the curriculum, uh, being innovative, adopting the best thinking outside of the business school to create the place where the best business students in the world want to study. We believe there is no better place to study at the intersection of business, economics, policy, and international affairs than right here at Georgetown. The endowment of the Barada Center for Global Business is our next step as a leader in this field. Joe has also allowed us to elevate and enhance the Global Business Fellows Program the Global Business Fellows allow the McDonald's School of Business and the School of Foreign Service to join forces because the dynamic of that classroom is unique. The Fellows have the opportunity of traveling abroad and do a consulting project with a global company. The students feel that this is an experience that actually transforms them. This new gift to endow the center, support our global business fellows program and enable further innovations to our curriculum is allowing us to strengthen our leadership in global business education. I'm hoping that the Global Business Fellows Program and the Barada Global Business Center will create an easier pathway for students to take advantage of the best of Georgetown and attract the students who are most interested in helping drive change in the business world with a global perspective. Thank you, President DeJoya, for the introduction. This is a great day for Georgetown. Georgetown has evolved over the years. I remember when Jack, President DeJoya, described the evolution of Georgetown from a regional university to a national university to an international university into what we are today, a global university. The McDonald School of Business has always excelled at global business and the gift from the Barada family consolidates the process even further. The global environment that characterizes the business world of today has pointed out the importance of understanding what happens beyond the geographical boundaries of one country. COVID-19 has been the best proof of it. We recognize the world became a marketplace not only for selling but also for buying. Globalization affects every country regardless of its economic, political, or social situation. The globalized world forces us to seek and develop appropriate ways to undergo this process. Actually, it is thanks to globalization that many of you have an iPhone, which is touched by more than 7,400 suppliers around the world. And those of you that like Starbucks, a single cup is touched by over 19 countries. There is an open debate about the future of globalization. However, globalization is here to stay. The world is more interconnected and interrelated than ever. What is changing is not globalization, but globalism. Globalism is an ideology based on the belief that people, information, and goods should be able to cross national borders. In fact, Globalism is the ideological component of globalization. The ideology is shifting, but not globalization, which continues to exist while taking different forms. Globalization is not a belief, it's the actual spread of technology, products, information, and jobs around the world. Whereas globalism is static, globalization is evolving and changing. To illustrate, U.S. imports of goods from China dropped to less than 17% last year from a high of 22% in 2017. However, countries such as Mexico, Vietnam, and South Korea have gained a share over China 
with Vietnam increasing its exports to the U.S. to $120 billion, a more than tenfold increase since 2007. At the same time, China's footprint in the Americas is increasing dramatically, and Beijing is now the second largest trade partner in the region after the United States. We all agree that understanding global business is essential for our students. It provides them with job opportunities, cultural awareness, improved problem-solving skills, entrepreneurial opportunities, and uh, personal growth. Understanding global business helps students develop cultural awareness and sensitivity. Students learn about different cultural norms, values, and practices, which can help them work more effectively with people from diverse backgrounds. Studying global business can be a transformative experience for students as it exposes them to new perspectives and challenges them to think critically about the world around them. This can lead to personal growth and development that extends beyond the classroom. The Global Business Fellows, created almost 10 years ago, was a first attempt to expand in a structured way our offerings to the undergraduate students. It provides them with a comprehensive education and valuable experiences that can help them succeed in a rapidly changing global economy. The program offers rigorous curriculum that includes courses from MSB and SFS, in addition to language requirements. Students also participate in a variety of extracurricular activities, including internships, visits to embassies, study abroad programs, and professional development workshops. The program aims to develop student skills in critical thinking, problem solving, and communication, and provides them with a deep understanding of global business issues. Students in the program also benefit from networking opportunities with alumni and industry leaders, as well as access to career services and resources. I want to personally thank the Barada family, and Joe in particular, for his continued support to the program. We had many, many, many conversations, and I have to say Joe is a true believer. So I want to just thank, in the name of Georgetown, for all this incredible contribution, incredible philanthropic investment in Georgetown. And now I would like to introduce Ana Mercedes Mendoza, one of the first Shining Star alumni of the GBF, to share with us some of her own experiences. Ana. Thank you, Professor Ernst. Thank you, Professor Ernst, for the introduction. It is always a pleasure to be back at the Hilltop. To stand here today is a humbling experience. In representation of the Global Business Fellows and not alumni and future generations to come, it is my honor to thank the Barada family once again for their generosity and commitment towards the program. I would also like to express my gratitude to President DeJoya, Dean Almeida, Professor Ernst, and the GBF faculty. It is your passion that drives impact across generations. My Global Business Fellows journey started back in 2015. The privilege to participate in global debates applicable to business, technology, politics, and cultural realities gave me an inherent responsibility to be an engaged global citizen. The GBF's DNA often reminds you to stay informed to speak the truth, take risks, and most importantly, make daily ethical decisions with positive impact towards society. When I completed my dual degree between the McDonough School of Business and the School of Engineering at Columbia University, I took an unconventional path for both careers, but not for a global fellow. I decided to turn down the IB and data science track and took the opportunity in an investment firm in Sao Paulo. Not knowing a word of Portuguese, having an enormous visa risk as a Venezuelan, parents terrified, my boyfriend at the time, who is my, now my husband, in New York, I was there in five days. 
The perfect storm turned quickly into one of the best professional decisions I could have ever made. After long hours, many models, mistakes, and learnings, I get randomly called in by one of the three partners, Georgia Paolo Linen, to tell me that I was selected to join the growth and innovations team at AB and Beth in New York. You're ready to drive operational value, he said. With my heart pounding, I asked him, what makes someone suited for this role? Quickly, he said, their unbreakable ethics and grit. As soon as I arrived to New York, I started working with a small team, directly implementing the new transformational playbook in over six different countries. Quickly, I find myself drafting a plan tailored to each region's realities. After all, while technology and business processes can be standardized, cultures and legal frameworks cannot. The GBF professors will certainly teach you that. While I experienced professional growth, I miss seeing the impact of my decisions, building judgment, and feeling uncomfortable. I pick up the phone, call Giorgio Paolo, to tell him that his trust, that thank him for his trust, and simultaneously mention that it was time for me to embark in my next challenge. He responded, finally, I was wondering what your grid was. Hence, after a year ago, about a year ago, I decided to join a couple of Georgetown classmates and Columbia alums at Blank Street, a specialty coffee chain. At the time, it was becoming very clear through the economic and political landscape that we needed to focus on driving operational efficiencies while building a sustainable brand. Another GVF topic. Anyway, I can go for hours on how this unique program provides you structural thinking for impact at scale. I would always be grateful for having the flexibility to major in finance at the McDonough School of Business while receiving the GBF edge. Mr. Broad, my story is one of many fellows out there whom I admire and multiple journeys to come. I have no doubt that this program will be transformational not only for students, but for Georgetown University as a whole. I look forward to interacting and reading in the news about all the soon-to-be fellows back in the crowd. My best wishes to all, and please stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, you can see why we're so proud of the Global Business Fellows Program, and especially of, 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 uh, we're proud of our Global Business Fellows alumni like you. Thank you for coming down from New York and sharing your testimony. And now it's, we're ready to hear from the man himself, Joe Barada, who will be in conversation with Professor Rena Agarwal, about the future of private equity. Thank you both for lending your time and expertise, and we are gonna listen very carefully and gonna make some investments after this. <laughs> uh, there will be an opportunity for Q&A from the audience at the end of the conversation, so please save your questions until the end. Joe and Rena, please come up. Well, Joe, it's such a privilege to flip seats, right? As a professor, to have your former student you learn from, that's absolutely amazing. So we're just so proud of everything that you've done and that you continue to do for Georgetown at the McDonough School. I also want to thank you for serving on the board of the Pissarro Center for Financial Markets and Policy. Uh, let me start with sort of a big picture question, and you, you mentioned that in the video. Private equity and finance more broadly, a lot of people will say these are just greedy people. They are out there to squeeze jobs, they are out there to make profits. H how do you respond to that? How does private equity actually help the global society, whether it's innovation, whether it's job creation, whether it's economic growth, what role does private equity play in this broader economy? Well, it's an important question, Rena. Thank you um, for starting with it, because I think it's um, particularly in this politically charged um, 
climate that we're in, never uh, uh, more so in, in history, really, at least that I can remember. Um, I, business has become part of that uh, politicization, and, and I would say private equity uh, at the sharp edge of capitalism uh, is on the receiving end of, of much criticism, which some of which may be fair, but much of which I think is uninformed. Um, we, inv as I said in the, in the unfortunate video that was shown, which is um, all of this sort of laudatory stuff is not what I love, but um, anyway, we invest on behalf of nearly 40 million retirees to help ensure uh, their retirement. So the California teachers, um, uh, the state of Washington, my brother's a police officer in Portland, Oregon, you know, I have a small part in managing uh, his pension, um, sovereign wealth funds in, uh, uh, in Korea, in, in Singapore, in uh, Canada. Um, this is for whom we're investing. Uh, and this is what I think about every day when we're uh, looking at, at buying companies, making investments is, is, you know, is this going to further the um, security of these pensioners? And is this going, are we gonna do it in a way that we're proud of? I mean, Blackstone has been around uh, for uh, 37 going on 38 years for a reason, not because we buy companies and leave them to die. Uh, it's because we buy companies uh, to invest in them and make them better. Uh, Jack, you mentioned Merlin, uh, which in 2005, um, uh, Merlin, this small little business that had um, 20 aquariums in the London dungeon in the UK. I don't know if you've ever been there in London. Um, it's kind of uh, corny. Um, but we, we backed a young, ambitious CEO named Nick Varney, uh, who just retired from Merlin after almost 40 years uh, this year, um, to build a global visitor attraction business with real scale, something that didn't really exist outside of the large corporates like Disney um, and, and Universal. Uh, we acquired the Legoland theme parks from, you won't believe it, but back then, uh, Lego, the toy company, which was manufacturing, to talk about globalization, plastic bricks in Denmark and in Switzerland, um, uh, they were running out of money, and they had yet found uh, the great benefit of affiliating with great IP like Star Wars and Harry Potter and other things, and they were just reliant on enforcing patent protections uh, to ensure other Toy companies didn't make plastic bricks. So they found themselves in uh, a difficult uh, position as a company. They had built these four theme parks. They didn't know how to run theme parks. They needed cash. So backing Merlin, we bought uh, the Legoland business from uh, Lego, which uh, was a family, to this day, a family-owned business. The family took back a 30% stake in the Merlin entity. And since then, and we still own Merlin today to talk about short-termism in investing, we've owned this company. Uh, for uh, nearly 20 years now. And I mean, there were some things in between that happened, but we still own it. Um, uh, there are now, instead of four Legoland parks that we bought uh, uh, in 2005, uh, there are now close to 12. Uh, there's something called the Legoland Discovery Center, which is a mall-based uh, um, experience, shorter term stay. Uh, and Merlin itself has grown to be the largest visitor attraction company next to Disney, employing many tens of thousands of people deploying billions and billions of dollars of capital uh, in new attractions uh, in corporate infrastructure. And so this is what private equity is about. Uh, along the way, for the great teachers of the state of California, we made uh, almost $2 billion of profit, which is fantastic for them. But we created a company that really could not have existed without the involvement of private equity. Who is going to do that? Who is going to back this young CEO in this little company in Britain with 100 million pounds of enterprise value and about 14 million pounds of EBITDA into what today uh, is, will do this year over 600 million pounds of EBITDA uh, and is a globally important company. And so that's what private equity actually is. Yes, there are examples from some firms that don't aspire to be institutions like Blackstone uh, that may act less responsibly. Uh, but in the mainstream, private equity is great for its investors and it's good for the communities and the employees of those companies. Mm -hmm. so, so we're talking about the future of private equity. The last decade has been pretty unusual. We've had very low cost of capital and uh, low inflation, low interest rates, a lot of dry powder, and uh, mostly driven, I would say, by the role that the central banks globally have played. What about the next 10, 15 years? I mean, I'm not thinking just tomorrow and uh, next year, but next 10, 15 years, what are major changes? Is it 
regions? Is it sectors? Is it uh, valuation? What's going to be happening in the next decade? I'd say the last, um, up until the end of 2021, eight or so years from 2013 until the end of 2021 were the most difficult uh, uh, time I've had as an investor. And, and I've been doing this now in, at Blackstone for 25 years and private equity for 27 years. And, and this will be my 30th anniversary uh, uh, from graduating from Georgetown. Um, th there was a, a completely artificial market that was made by the Federal Reserve and then in COVID by uh, the federal government, and literally sending money to people, which created uh, distortions in, in investment valuations, in growth rates of companies, and importantly, large-scale misallocation of capital to increasingly riskier investments, which, which crescendoed in um, you know, growth equity and SPACs and you know, venture capital valuations and even private equity valuations for, for more mature businesses that wasn't sustainable. And we were trying to compete as more, you know, I, I studied from great people like you and Ricardo and others uh, about how you value a business. I think Dr. Eberhardt is here somewhere. I took his finance course. Um, and, and it really was foundational for the way I thought about investing money. And you had to forget all of those things if you wanted to be a successful investor circa 2017, 2018, which I was refusing to forget. So we were falling behind uh, some firms that were investing in growth equity and some of our competitors that were less disciplined and more willing uh, to forget what they had learned as finance students. Um, but I knew deep down that the world would change, that, that you cannot have a world of a growing economy with negative real interest rates and looming inflation and have that be sustainable. And that would ultimately uh, uh, correct in, in much higher global cost of capital uh, uh, and, and a significant decline in valuations, which of course did happen. It just took five years longer than I thought. Uh, and that was, that was difficult. It was a very difficult moment to be a professional investor. Um, even though the stuff you bought was worth more, you didn't feel like you had anything to do with that, like you weren't being smart. The rising tide was lifting all boats. That's now over. We're now in a world that looks much more like the world I've, I grew accustomed to, like that I feel comfortable in positive real rates, you know, economic volatility, a market risk premium that makes sense, credit spreads that uh, are, are wider, you know, uh, long-term rates more like 4 or 5%, not 2%. Uh, and so we can go back to being more sort of fundamental uh, type investors. Private equity in that last 10 or 15 years has also evolved very significantly. There are industries that you just can't invest in anymore. You know, we haven't, we haven't invested in bricks and mortar retail or traditional media businesses that have uh, linear media advertising based models uh, since probably 2005. Um, we don't want to invest in, in upstream hydrocarbons. We don't want to invest in single use plastics. We may talk about ESG later, um, just because they don't have futures. Um, so the types of things that private equity firms are investing in these days is much different than it would have been you know, 20 years ago. The whole software asset class was deemed sort of uninvestable until some really clever uh, people, Robert Smith at Vista, Orlando Bravo, who was, we were analysts together at Morgan Stanley sitting in the same cube. Um, he's been much more successful than me, um, but he's built this amazing firm investing in, in, in software buyouts. These are, these are all innovations in private equity over the last 10 or 15 years, and there will be more innovations to come. Our true north is buy great businesses that have a future. You know, so we don't, we're not value investors per se. We're not looking to buy things at low multiples of cash flow because we can. Uh, we're looking to buy things that have a future that, all, that we can improve, that can grow, and ultimately somebody else will want to buy, either the public markets or, or a corporate buyer uh, after our ownership period. Uh, and there will be uh, evolutions in, 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 in how private equity invests. Just two years ago, we did something I never really could have imagined we'd do. We backed two ex-Disney uh, uh, executives, Kevin Mayer and Tom Staggs, both of whom should have been CEO of Disney, uh, to build an independent content creation uh, and commerce company. Uh, we started partnering with w Reese Witherspoon in her Hello Sunshine uh, production company, which is, which is really the category defining creator of content uh, for women, uh, uh, content that's created by women for a much broader audience uh, because Reese couldn't find 
uh, production companies willing to do that, so she took the mantle herself and over five years built a very valuable business. We've now partnered with her, own control of her business, and we also own a children's content company called Moonbug, whose largest content is Coco Melon, uh, which is on, largely on YouTube. So this is a new media asset that 10 years ago I don't think we would have con contemplated uh, investing in, but because of how uh, content is being delivered because how filmed entertainment is being made today, we see an opportunity to create value. So yes, the future for private equity I think is quite bright. How we invest will, will, will certainly evolve. Any regions of the world that you're more excited about? You, know, you were in London, uh, you, you went to London very early on in your career, and uh, what does Europe look like? What does Asia look like? I think Europe is an interesting economy. It's not an innovation economy in the same way that the United States is. It, it is an environmentalism, I'd say. So we have, we've invested in energy transition, companies that are enabling the transition from hydrocarbon-based uh, electricity to <clears throat> renewable sources. I think Europe does have uh, an edge in, in developing those technologies and also industrial technology. It doesn't have the, the content uh, and software uh, and sort of tech innovation that the United States have. The other really interesting uh, part of the world is India. Uh, uh, India is an educated, optimistic, um, capitalistic, friendly uh, economy that has this manifest destiny to grow. Uh, and they are becoming a very important partner to large Western firms uh, in the supply of, of critical uh, uh, human talent services uh, and critical components. We own an electric vehicle component manufacturer that's based in India. We own many IT services, cloud transition, business process outsourcing businesses in India. And I think as globalism does change and our counterparties begin to evolve, um, I think India is positioned to be a winner in that evolution. So on a couple of things you've touched about what I'd broadly call ESG, environment, social, and governance. Uh, how are you encouraging your portfolio companies to move in that direction and do better, which obviously has a huge impact on the global society? There's two ways we think about this. Our, our customers, of course, like I said, the state of California, <clears throat> large um, sovereign wealth funds, care very much about uh, uh, how we invest what we own, uh, uh, as do we. Uh, and so there are just certain things we don't want to own. Uh, where we don't really want to uh, court controversy. So that's one way to be sort of an ESG investor, is just don't buy the things that aren't ESG friendly, upstream oil and gas, other things. Um, the other way uh, is once we own a business, there are specific, and, and we own, in my business, uh, there are other businesses in Blackstone that don't own control, but my business is, is the control investing strategy. We can actually implement certain uh, programs. We have three. Which, which we've started, uh, and it won't be limited to these three. Um, one is on carbon emissions reduction. So we are seeking to reduce carbon emissions in a finite five-year period of time of 15% across the portfolio. Those targets will grow over time. Uh, and ultimately, you know, we would like to be aligned with science-based targets to be you know, admissions um, net zero at some point. Um, secondly, uh, on, our, on our boards of directors, we uh, have a mandate to have one-third of our uh, directors to be from underrepresented groups in the population. And we have now achieved that, I think, on 98% of our portfolio company boards. And the third thing, um, which is, which is I actually, I personally led in, in part of my other philanthropic effort is in how does this country create a truly uh, level playing field, is um, driving... Um, a change in how we recruit talent across all of our companies um, so that we can have uh, uh, access to underrepresented talent pools that historically haven't even had a chance to interview for management level jobs. And we're partnering with Year Up and other community-based organizations that allows our companies to access talent pools that heretofore they haven't had an opportunity to access. There aren't specific numerical targets with that. It's literally changing the job requirements, the schools from which our companies recruit uh, talent uh, to achieve true organic diversity over time in our portfolio. So that, those are the three initiatives that we're focused on. Uh, now there will be others, but ESG is a, is, is a central part of how we invest. And of course, you won't read that 
in the New York Times or the Washington Post because why would they write something good about you know finance firms? Um, uh, but but these are these are things that we are, are are doing and 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 I don't see you know many public companies out there doing this doing the same things actually. So you mentioned uh, California uh, pension fund a couple of times. But what about all those other states like Florida and Texas and uh, s several other uh, AGs who are, there's a big backlash from uh, some part of the, uh, how do you manage it from a fundraising point of view, from an investment point of view? Yeah, I, I think we, we've been careful, um, you know, to, to do things that are, that are incremental and achievable, not, not radical and unlikely to be achieved. And so, you know, n n nobody in the state of Florida is against carbon emissions reductions. What they are against is a outright ban on the on the um, a pumping of hydrocarbons and transporting transporting them around the country. Because we still, turns out, we still need them to function as an economy. Uh, um, but I, I, we're not seeing pressure in that regard because we're not out there making these broad pronouncements and trying to vilify certain industries. Uh, we are in Washington, so I have to ask you this question. Certain regulators, policymakers, mm -hmm. uh, they see private equity as this dark market, not enough transparency, and uh, there have been all kinds of uh, proposals put out there in terms of what should happen in terms of regulation of private equity. It, do, you, do you see a part where, yeah, maybe more disclosure is required, and then other proposals that have come up that just don't make sense? Yes, um, we are a, a large and important part of the uh, financial markets, and there should be scrutiny applied to what we do and the disclosures we make. And that scrutiny has has increased really very significantly over the last thirty years, uh, and and I think that's right and that's justified, um, but to a limit. I mean, we are private. We have private companies, not public companies, and so holding private equity and private equity's portfolio to public company disclosure standards would defeat the purpose of being private in the first place. Otherwise, everything might as well just be public. So that I think there are certain things to a limit where it becomes uh, no longer a protection for the investors, which is really what the SEC uh, is there for, is to protect investors, to shed a light on what we charge, how we charge the fees, uh, having, having our counterparties know about, and that all has been done and I think is very well understood. Uh, general performance metrics, how we report our IRRs and net multiples of money, those are all things that need to be conformed, uh, uh, audited, which of course we're a public company ourselves, so we are audited and held to uh, the, most, uh, the highest level of scrutiny. Um, so I believe that there should be transparency in private markets, and there is. The issue that starts to come into play is, is considering financial firms like Blackstone systemically important. We're not taking depositors' money, you know, and buying you know mortgages or you know companies with it. We are taking money from pension plans who want exposure to pr the private equity asset class that have willingly locked up their money for decades to have us invest on their behalf. So there is complete alignment between what we're investing in and what our customers want us to invest in. And they're allocating us relatively small portions of their portfolio because they know it is on average a riskier enterprise than just investing in 10-year treasuries or in mortgages or something. So I think that's where the, the regulatory scrutiny becomes, I think, no longer uh, necessary uh, or, or efficient for the system. So but a last question before we make sure we open it up to questions from the audience. You gave a talk at commencement at the McDonough School, and you talked about the Georgetown factor and how it has impacted you. Can you elaborate a little bit more about what this Georgetown factor is? Yeah, well, I think Georgetown graduates have, um, are distinctive. Uh, and as you can see that manifest in what Anna said, you know, grit and, and honesty. Um, uh, I think these days, it's so hard to get into Georgetown. We're talking about admissions the other day, and we have 12% admissions rate or something. And if you use the common app, it would be 4%. Um, uh, we're, we're interviewing people in the audience who are sophomores in college for internships at Blackstone, which I, I mean, I understand why we have to do that. I think it's ridiculous, but um, 
that that is that's where it is. So so people are forced to work so hard and to be so goal oriented so early in their time that when they graduate school, which is just the beginning, there's a set of expectations on what they should be doing and how they should be treated. And and I think Georgetown students come with a sense of humility and patience and that the world is not to be given over to them just because they've survived the gauntlet of, of, of getting into school and getting an internship and getting into an analyst program. Because once you get there, once you've graduated, you have another 10 or 15 years to figure out if you're really good at the thing you've chosen to do. And you'll probably change either jobs or careers um, once or often twice. I had three jobs before I got to Blackstone. And so if you come in with a sense of like entitlement and I'm meant to be doing this and I should, then, then that the, the, the employer is not going to look as kind, that kindly uh, on it. So I think Georgetown does a nice job of teaching honesty, humility, patience. We're playing a, a, a long game as people uh, uh, and as professionals. Uh, and I think it's very important that um, uh, the school keeps that culture. Um, and I can say that they're, they're really, in, in the people we hire at Blackstone from Georgetown, that is distinctive to them. Uh, and I think that's, those are elements of the Georgetown factor that I discussed back in 2019. Fantastic. Wow. Fantastic. What an opportunity to hear from the master himself, the master of private equity. So thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe and Rena, for a wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you, Joe, for answering everything with the Georgetown factor openly, honestly, and directly, even tough questions about hospitals and doctors. Uh, I just want to recognize a few people. Uh, we're really thankful to have our provost, Robert Groves, here. I want to thank uh, Bryn Dolan, one of our leaders in advancement who worked for many years with Joe to make this gift possible. Thank you so much, Bryn. <laughs> and I'd like to welcome uh, our new executive director of the Barada Center for Global Business, Dr. Anil Kurana. We wish you well. And now, just, uh, I know Joe and Abby don't want this, but I think just one more time, we need to show them our appreciation for their, uh, for their commitment to Georgetown and the McDonough School of Business. Thank you so much. And that brings the event to the close. Uh, we have some things to nibble at. I hope you'll continue to mill around, uh, chat with each other. Thank you all so much. Thank you.